The unsurpassed, profound, and wonderful Dharma is difficult to encounter in billions of aeons, and I'll see it here, receive and uphold it, a vow to fathom the Targa's true meaning, to liberate all beings, thus generate the Supreme Bodhicitta. Now let us continue with our class on the Mahayana Shurangama Sutra. The Shurangama Sutra, I think by now you're very clear on how profound this sutra is, on the profundity of the method of meditation or on the application this particular teaching is given to all of us through the conversations given uh, the conversations the Buddha had between Ananda and uh, Arhats and Bodhisattvas through the conversation through various examples and through various explanations the Buddha then expounded the teaching of the nature of mind being the union of emptiness and luminosity therefore I think all of you who are sitting here attending this class by having this opportunity to listen to such a supreme teaching, you must have had accumulated a great amount of merit, and this is the fruition of it. Otherwise, I don't think you'll be able to encounter such a supreme sutra, though I am just an ordinary monk to uh, whom giving you the teaching on this Supreme Sutra. But we're entering into the particular scene that was 2,500 years ago during the time of the Buddha. And we have such a fortune to witness the conversation between the Buddha and the Noble Ones. Therefore, we must be very fortunate. I understand that we're so trapped in samsara, we can say that we have lots of afflictions and a, a great deal of negative karma, and uh, we're very much tethered by all kinds of uh, our karmic forces and our afflictions, and we don't have the true freedom yet. But acknowledging that we're living in this dark age and being fettered by all of that, yet we encounter the supreme teaching, I believe. We ought to generate great happiness and great joy from the bottom of our hearts. Now let's continue with the teaching of Shurangama Sutra. Previously, in our classes, we've already covered that the nature of mind, though Ananda kept on thinking that there is a something solidly existent as the sea nature. And then the Buddha kept on giving various examples and expounding the teaching to Ananda through various ways to demonstrate that the seen nature is not something that is solid, it's not something that is graspable. After saying that, Ananda, as well as many of the noble ones in the assembly that have not attained the stage of no learning, they were completely confused. They were very much dazed, they didn't know what to do, and started to feeling a bit anxious. And then the Buddha compassionately consoled them, saying that, oh, don't be afraid. If you don't understand, that's okay. Just as long as you understand that the Buddha is the one who speaks the truth and only truth, 
does not lie or, can, or deceive. As long as you know that, then um, it is not going to be harmful to you. Now to continue, Mantra Shri appears. Previously, we already saw that during the conversation of the Buddha and Ananda, King Pasanati also stood up and started to speak. And then at the time when the Buddha was giving the teaching to Ananda and when uh, the Great Assembly received the teaching, they were very anxious and confused. The Supreme, Bo uh, Supreme Bodhisattva of Wisdom the Mantra Shri Bodhisattva stood up. We know that Mantra Shri is the foremost of wisdom. Um, and in the Hinayana tradition, the foremost in wisdom is Shariputra. And uh, foremost in miraculous actions is uh, Madhagalayana. And in Mahayana tradition, the foremost in wisdom is Mantra Shri because he completely understood emptiness which surpassed all of the uh, Shravaka uh, practitioners. Therefore, it is necessary for Manjushri to appear and join into the conversation. During the conversations between the Buddha and his disciples, especially whenever there are some profound, profound teachings being expounded, usually Shupati would appear or sometimes Mandrushri. So let's look at what Mandrushri is talking about. Then Mandrushri, son of the Dharma king, took pity on the four assemblies, rose from his seat in the midst of the great assembly, bowed at the Buddha's feet, placed his palms together respectfully, and said to the Buddha, World honored one. So he started to address the Buddha. In fact, the Dharma heir, the Dharma prince Manjushri, though he appears in such a way as a youthful prince, but we know that many Buddhas, including Shakyamuni Buddha, they had made aspiration in front of Shakya, uh, in front of Manjushri Bodhisattvas, uh, Bodhisattva in their past lives. But uh, Manjushri always benefit, benefited everyone uh, and all sentient beings with the form of a youth prince. At that time, this Dharma prince took pity upon the four assemblies, the four assemblies being Bhikkhu Bhikkhunis, uh, Yupusaka, and uh, Yupasikas. So he stood up and then addressed the Buddha by saying that a world honored one, the great assembly, has not awakened to the principle of the thus come one's twofold disclosure of the essence of seeing as being both form and emptiness and as being neither of them. What are the two folds of uh, explosions then? That is, uh, the essence of seeing and form and emptiness. The essence of seeing, we've already discussed this before, it is the nature of mind, and they are translated as essence of seeing in this particular Chinese translation. It is luminous and it is unconditioned. Sometimes we call it awareness or rigpa. This is the essence of seeing. And he said that this empty, uh, this form emptiness, which is everything, all phenomena, all the external objects such as sound, touch, smell, fragrance, and so on and so forth, those are the objects. Previously, all the assembly had this um, confusion about the essence of seeing and the objects are they of one thing or not? What's the condition? What's the connection 
between them. So the essence of seeing and form emptiness, are they of one thing or are they not? Are they all essence of seeing or are they all form emptiness? Because we know that the assembly, including Ananda, at that time they were still at the state of conceptual uh, thinking and they had not entered into the wisdom state. That state is similar to materialistic view of, for example, the kind of view that we share nowadays quite pervasively or the Sabativada school according to the uh, Kinayana vehicle. So they would search for something that is graspable. Therefore, they cannot fathom something that is unfathomable. It is quite far away and so um, unattainable to them. But according to Sutra, it says that if you can't attain something, if you can't attain the characteristic as being something, then it is consciousness. If you can't attain the characteristic, that is the wisdom. Therefore, they're still at the state of uh, such a kind of mental consciousness state. At that time, they don't understand the essence of seeing and object. What are the relationship? What's the relationship between the two? The Manjushri Bodhisattva at that time then further expounded on this particular topic. Manjushri at the time expounded um, in such a way by saying that a world honored one, if the causal form, emptiness, and other phenomena mentioned above or the seeing, there should be an indication of its distance. So there's a way to point to it. And if they were not the seeing, there should be nothing visible to be seen. So all the things that appears right in front of us, the phenomena, the objects to be seen, as well as all the empty, all the form emptiness. The form emptiness, according to some commentary, it says that it is the phenomena, some explained as the ones that has form and without form or conditioned and unconditioned. There are different ways of explaining this form of emptiness. Anyhow, it says that whatever phenomena that's right in front of us, the object to be, to be perceived, to be seen, if they would be perceived, if we can see them, then we, we definitely should be able to point to it. Just like a vase, a pillar, then you should be able to point it out. If the seeing nature or seeing essence is like so, like the form emptiness, you should also be able to point out the seeing essence. And if they were not the seeing, they should be nothing visible to be seen. So if there is nothing to be seen, then they're not part of the domain of our seeing nature. They're just like the child of a barren woman or the horn of a, 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 a rabbit. But you shouldn't come to that kind of recognition because people still would say that there is something to be seen. There is an object. So over here, Manjushri basically readdressed these two controversial questions and represented the group of people who were very confused to ask this question again. 
And then he continued to say that now that we do not know what is meant, and this is why we are alarmed and concerned. Manjushri over here said that, well, this group of disciples, especially Ananda, still do not understand what this seen nature is. And their main concern is that they cannot point to something if there is something to be seen. So they don't understand that yet. And then, um, since there's nothing to be pointed to as the seen nature, and they're still perceivable, they're still seen by the seen nature, therefore this group of people get very confused and uh, alarmed. This is the question that represents lots of our mundane beings of view. A lot of times we feel that the seen nature, this awareness, it feels like it is existent, but sometimes we feel that it can be existent. There is something there, but we can't point to it. And then at that time, we would feel a little bit alarmed about our practice. Or we would start to doubt, is that really the nature that I'm, I have already seen? Is that really the seen nature? So we would have doubts and then feel alarmed and feel doubtful about our practice. And then uh, Manjushri continued to say that it is not that our good roots from the former lives are deficient. So Manjushri said that, well, the disciples must feel quite alarmed right now and uh, feel doubtful. And uh, the disciples, because they feel lar uh, alarmed and uh, a bit scared even, they may then um, think that it is because their uh, virtuous roots is not sufficient. According to the commentary of Finger and a Palm, it says that many people after listening to the teaching of Avatamsaka Sutra, many would fall fainted. And on the, the Great Assembly of listening to the, the uh, teaching on the Vipoya Sutra, then they would also feel a sense of inconceivable and feel quite alarmed and couldn't accept the teaching of the Vipoya Sutra. So Manjushri over here addressed the Buddha saying that there are people who had not accumulated enough for, uh, meritorious roots, then they might not be able to receive or they might not be able to receive this teaching or accept this kind of teaching because their insights have not uh, attained to that level yet. And then uh, Manjushri continued to address the Buddha, saying that we only hope that thus come one will have the great compassion to reveal exactly what all the things are and what the seeing nature is. The external objects and the seen nature, what's the relation between the two? What is it? So what exactly is this seen nature? Is it that there is no question of is or is not in all of this? Since we cannot find it, then is it or is it not the same thing? Because the disciples feel quite confused. It is very ambiguous between is existent and is not existent. So the same nature and the external object, are they of the same characteristic or are they not? This is quite crucial to understand. As mundane beings, I think our mindset is very much like uh, the description in the Beacon of Certainty composed by Mipar in Bichir, where he said that we constantly feel that the union means a black rope twisted together with a white rope. It's the two things twisted together. This is how the mundane beings perceive union. 
the idea of union. So when it comes to seeing the true nature of mind, they constantly feel that there is something truly existent, or they feel that there is not something that is truly existent. It's very easy to fall into the two extremes. Within the very narrow conceptual mind of the ordinary beings, it's very difficult to understand, to come to the realization of the uh, of wisdom, and we're constantly measuring the space with the unit of an eye of a needle. Then that is why Manjushri at the time again repeated the question of Ananda and then um, requested the great compassionate Buddha to expound the teaching to the great assembly, saying that what is the connection between seeing nature and the object? In fact, between the seeing nature and the the, the uh, object, there is really nothing separate, but this is not understood by Ananda. I think we also feel the same way. We're very confused in the similar way to Ananda. Sometimes we feel that all the object is a support for our mind. Sometimes we also, according to the sutras, feel that, yes, everything is created by mind. Sometimes we feel that the Objects are the conditions, and based on these conditions, then there's the eye consciousness and so on. And then the consciousness comes in uh, to from the second moment onwards, especially according to Vinaya Sutra. However, whenever it comes to our own insight, if we have not attained to that stage of the inconceivable um, state, a stage, then we will not be able to be liberated from this conf uh, seemingly conflictive uh, uh, state of mind. And then the Buddha compassionately started to address Ananda and uh, Mandrashri's question and expounded his teaching. This particular teaching given by the Buddha is uh, the real answer to address this question, and we should contemplate upon it. At that time, the Buddha told Mandrashri and the Great Assembly to the thus come ones and the great bodhisattvas of the ten directions who dwell in the samadhi, seeing the conditions of seeing, as well as the characteristics of thought, are like flowers in space, fundamentally non-existent. Over here, the Buddha very compassionately addressed, uh, replied to Mandrashri and uh, Ananda by saying that the bodhisattvas of all directions and the great bodhisattvas, as well as those who abide in samadhi, which is the self-nature samadhi, shurangama samadhi. Shurangama, because the title of the sutra, Shurangama Sutra, is named after the name of this particular samadhi. So it says that all of those who are abiding this samadhi, they're seeing and the condition of seeing, as well as all the uh, characteristic of thoughts, are just like flowers in space. Now, a key point has been being expounded quite clearly to us, to the great bodhisattvas and the Buddhas who abide in samadhis like such, they attain a state like that. However, for all of us who are simply mundane beings and have not attained any of the fruition nor abide in the state of uh, such supreme samadhis, it must be very difficult for us to attain such kind of realization. In their perception, one is seeing and the other one is the condition of seeing. In terms of seeing, there are uh, a few different explanations. Master Changshui's explanation is that the seeing is consciousness and the um, condition of seeing is the root. So the root and consciousness, as well as the characteristic of thoughts, the character of thoughts, so those are objects. Therefore, the seeing should be immediate preceding condition and uh, the, the condition of 
see is the focal condition, which is reliant on our roots. All of the objective phenomena are imputed, therefore they are considered as dominant condition. So all of those that's gathered together are no other than the flowers blossom in space. According to Master Ji Huan, his explanations a bit different. He said that the seeing is the root and the condition of the seeing is the object. The characteristic of thoughts is the consciousness. So he said that the seeing is the eyes, which is the root, and the condition of seeing is seeing the external phenomena, which is the um, observe or focal conditions. I think these two explanations can be explained together or can be understood together. Anyhow, these are the two uh, potential explanations that's available in the commentary. It is says that the external phenomena and the root and the consciousness and all of, th of that is gathered are just like the flowers in space. In the sixth chapter, it also talks about how the seeing and the hearing are just like an illusion and cataracts, the three realms are just like flowers in space. There is nothing solidly existent. This is quite, a, quite an important verse in this sutra. At that time, Buddha started addressing Manjushri and uh, the great four assemblies. He said that whatever we see, we hear, whatever that's gathered by our roots and consciousness, in fact, they had never even occurred. Are there flowers that's blossom? That, are there flowers blossoms in the sky, in the space? Are there um, gardens that set in the space? No, it had never even appeared. It had never occurred. Therefore, it is without birth, since it is without birth, it is without death. So all of that's imputed or the essence of seeing or the object, all the phenomena, in fact, they had never appeared. They are no other than flowers in space. When one abides in samadhi, in fact, none of them ever existed. So when we are in that samadhi, let it be happiness or unhappiness, let it be good or bad, external phenomena, let it be any kinds of dualism, Thoughts. In the nature, in that state of samadhi, in that state of wisdom of samadhi, had never occurred. Therefore, this is such an important term to remember. It's a key. And then the Buddha continued to say that uh, this seeing and its conditions are originally the wonderful, pure, bright substance of body. The seeing and the condition of the seeing, the seeing, which is the essence of uh, our seeing, and the condition of our seeing, which is the uh, external adventitious things, they are no other than the pure, bright substance of Bodhi. The bright substance of Bodhi is translated as Dharmakaya in the Tibetan translation. In some of the commentaries in the Chinese language, they also explained it as the Dharmakaya. So let it be the external phenomena or the mind consciousness. In fact, they are simply all pure. They are no other than Bodhi. They're just the play of a Dharmakaya. According to the treasury of the natural state, it is says that it is simply an adornment, it is simply of a, a wondrous force, a manifestation. Though they appear as something that's external, however, they're simply a manifestation of the inner Dhammakaya. Other than that, there is no substance that's to it. So I think the teaching is very similar to that. So how can one speak? of is and is not. In this kind of object phenomena that is like a flower in space, how could you say that 
there is or is not this seeing essence and this object, this consciousness and um, not consciousness. How can you differentiate it like that? In the great Mahaati realization, everything is no other than the play of awareness, than the nature of mind, the gnosis. So there is no way to, to obtain something that is a, a consciousness that is solidly existent and uh, that is not existent, just as in the pure, gold, the pure continent that's made of uh, only gold. How can you get ordinary rocks? There is no way to obtain that. And then the Buddha continued to give an example by saying that, Manjushri, I now ask you, take yourself as an example, Manjushri. Is there still another Manjushri? Is there a Manjushri who is and a Manjushri who is not? So the Buddha asked Manjushri, saying that, let me ask you a question. Is there another Manjushri? If there's another Manjushri, then is that Manjushri a Manjushri or not a Manjushri? If you do not understand this question, you probably would be very confused. What kind of question is that? That the Buddha, in fact, is standing at the highest level of his realization to expound the true Manjushri. That is his angle of explanation. Conventionally speaking, you cannot say that it is or it is not a Manjushri. They are both wrong. But when it comes to the Manjushri being the true, um, true Manjushri of the Absolute Truth, then the true, man true Manjushri is no other than one's nature of mind. After asking in such a way, the Buddha asked, well, so the Manjushri, is it Manjushri or is it not? Because you cannot find the contradictory nature of the characteristic on you. Therefore, the Buddha pointed out the nature of mind through giving the example of uh, asking Manjushri. He's saying that is the true Manjushri uh, does the true Manjushri has a Manjushri and uh, not a Manjushri, the two things at the same time? Manjushri, of course, is extremely smart. He said that, so it is, world honored one. I am truly Manjushri. There is no Manjushri who is. Why? If there were still another Manjushri who is Manjushri, there would be two Manjushris. But it is not that. Now that I am not Manjushri, in fact, neither of the two characteristics of it and is not exist. The answer that Manjushri gives to the Buddha is the true Manjushri of Dharmakaya Manjushri. This absolute Manjushri of the Dharmakaya Manjushri cannot be expounded by hypothesis or um, based on our conceptualization. This unconditioned Manjushri doesn't have a Manjushri, because if you were to say there is a Manjushri, then there is, a, is not a Manjushri. In that way, there would be two Manjushris. But it is not that now I am not Manjushri. In fact, neither of the two characteristics of is and it is not exist. This not a Manjushri doesn't mean that there is no Manjushri. That is the view of uh, uh, voidness. That is not possible. So in the conventional truth, we cannot say that there is no Manjushri. We can say that. Therefore, in that state of realization, there is no dualism of is and is not. Because he is in that absolute state of realization. Ponsuk Rinpoche, when he was given teaching at Mount Wutai, he composed a Doha song. I can't remember it too clearly, but I remember the gist of it. 
He said that the naturally existent mandatory within oneself is not known to one. Therefore, one would spend lots of effort in searching for mandatory, not without knowing the nature. One's nature is mandatory himself whom had never parted from one. The Manjushri Satna that he composed over there as well as the Tantra that's related to Manjushri and a few, do, a few Doha songs that he composed over there at Mount Wutai, they all, com, they all compounded, expounded on the teaching of the Absolute Manjushri, which has never parted from oneself, just as the peaceful uh, sadhana practice of Manjushri within the uh, refuge and aspiration, it is stated the content in such a way where it says that the true Manjushri had never parted from one. So this Manjushri, in fact, the absolute Manjushri has surpassed that of is and is not. It is not part of our dualistic mind that can comprehend. The Manjushri Sometimes we can only comprehend as a phenomenal Manjushri, the uh, appearance of Manjushri, but not the true Manjushri. According to the Five Lamps Zen text, it, there is a story that's included where uh, Zen master, Master Feng Gan, whom uh, wanted to travel to Mount Wutai, and he asked the Master Shida to travel with him. But Master Shida said that, um, why do you want to go there? Master Feng said that, I want to go there to pay homage to Manjushri. And Master Shida said that, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to uh, accompany you on that pilgrimage. Therefore, Master Feng went there by himself. When he arrived, he saw an old man, and then Master Feng Gan asked, Are you Manjushri? The old man replied, What is a Manjushri? And then Master Feng Gan started, uh, started to prostrate to him. After he prostrated to that old man, the old man disappeared. But that story didn't continue. Not so sure. So at this point, you're probably quite confused. What's the point of this story? In fact, many commentaries by the Zen masters did not continue to expound further about this particular story, didn't really explain it. But from my understanding, I think we can understand it from two aspects. One is that uh, since we are aware that Master Feng Gan is considered as the manifestation of Amitabha and Master Han Shan is considered as the manifestation of uh, Manjushri, therefore when Master Feng Gan asked, him, uh, asked the Master Han Shan to uh, pay homage to Mount Wutai, then as Manjushri himself, he didn't really want to go. That's understandable. On the other hand, there's another level of understanding, which is Master Feng Shan, when he went to Mount Wutai, he didn't seek for any other Manjushri, but when he encountered an, an old man, he then... Uh, recognized that is Manjushri himself because when he arrived at Mount Wutai, he had already seen his true absolute Manjushri, which is his own nature. 
So his own nature is Manjushri, is Samadabhadra, is the Buddha, is the luminous, unconditioned awareness, is the Gnosis. This is quite important. So the Manjushri can be understood in such ways, and the Manjushri is um, uh, presented in the story as allegories. But in the conventional sense, of course, you won't be able to understand it from the level of understanding of Ananda. Manjushri is Manjushri. You cannot say that there are two Manjushris. But once you understand the absolute truth from the level of realization that is beyond our conception, then we will be able to see the nature of our absolute mind, which is a true Manjushri. At that time, you will be able to see that the true Manjushri is beyond is and is not. And then the Buddha continued to expound to Manjushri by saying that this is not only the case with the seeing, the basic substance of a wonderful body, but also with emptiness and mundane objects. So the Buddha continued to say that whatever you see are no other than the luminous uh, are no other than the luminosity. It could be seeing essence or the gnosis or the nature of mind. So between the scene of the nature to that of the empty, um, empty objects or empty uh, dust, maybe the empty dust Dust means the external or adventitious things, and it is translated in such a way could be because of the original Sanskrit is written this way, or it could be for the beauty of the Chinese language. Not so sure why it's translated in such ways, and not sure why there are so many different terms to, that's used to describe the same thing. Sometimes we see the essence of seeing, sometimes we see the seeing of the nature, sometimes we see that it's empty dust, sometimes it is the uh, form emptiness, sometimes it's the external object. There are many different terms to describe the same thing. Thing. But in fact, it says that the luminous mind and the external objects are the same. Just as the true Manjushri doesn't have two particular um, dualistic characteristics, the mind and objects are of no other in the absolute truth. There are no dualism. According to the Sutra of Perfect Enlightenment, the conversation between the uh, between Manjushri or expound by Manjushri also talks about such non-dual teaching. In the Lotus Sutra, there's also teachings like that. But of course, to all of us as the mundane beings, we have to look for good and bad, right and wrong, white and black, and so on and so, on and so forth. But in the non-dual teachings, they often talk about the object and subject, the good and bad, and the existent or not, the high and lows, all of those are simply illusions. But we often feel that the black and white, the right and wrong, they have to have some kind of solid existence. There must be a true existence to it, but there is not. So over here, the Buddha said that the seeing and the object or the uh, projection or manifestation of the wonderful brightness of the unsurpassed the body, the pure, perfect, true mind, they are falsely taken to be form and emptiness as well as hearing and the seeing. The body that is wondrous, that is bright, and that is supreme, it has already, we already have them. This perfect nature, is already there without birth and uh, death. This is the true Supreme Bodhi. It is without any fault. It is completely pure. We already have such a mind like that. But because of our ignorance, because of the external conditions, and then at the end, they're, fo they're falsely taken to be form and emptiness because we take that they have 
uh, we falsely take them to have characteristics. And then because we grasp onto them as characteristics, so then we started to have the seeing and hearing. The Buddha then continued to say that just as with the second moon, which one is the moon and which one is not the moon, Mandrushri. This means that our true mind, this gnosis, in fact, it doesn't have all of these dualistic uh, differentiations, but because of our ignorance, such kind of illusions started to manifest in our object, in our objective phenomena. Just as the two moons or the uh, falsely perceived hair because of cataracts and all kinds of illness, those kinds of illusions would manifest. In fact, they don't, they don't exist at all, but they can manifest. And then the Buddha said that in Manjushri, there is only one true moon, and within it, there is, no, uh, there is not a moon that is, or a moon that is not. This example points to the nature of our mind. It's not to say, though the example is pointing to the moon, but it is not to say that the moon is solidly existent or not. That, that's not the, the point of it. Rather, the true moon points to the true nature of our mind. Just as the beacon of certainty says that the true moon and the water moon and the moon that uh, a moon that is painted or drawn, those are the various kinds of levels of realization to the noble ones. To see the nature of mind, at that time there are the two. Uh, there are the three examples associated with that. The true moon, which is the nature of our mind, that is the true pure moon. Um, and the supreme Bodhi. But with this condition, there could be the manifestation of the two moons. Out of the two moons, can you say which one is the real moon and which one is not? You cannot, you cannot find any of those. Therefore, you cannot say which one is and which one is not. Therefore, now, as you contemplate on the seeing and the mundane things together, all the things you disclose are called false thoughts. You cannot transcend is and is not from within them. All kinds of illusions and manifestations are simply the false thoughts. They are simply illusions. And because they are false thoughts, therefore you cannot transcend the state of is and is not. You won't be able to reach to the state of unconceivable. Uh, with the true essence, the wonderful enlightened bright nature, you can get beyond trying to point out or not point out. And then the Buddha started to expound on the true mind, the essence, the wonderful enlightened bright nature, the true essence, the Dharmakaya can let you surpass the pointing out or not pointing out. Master Changshui's commentary said that a pointing means seeing and not pointing means not seeing, which means that once you recognize the true nature of your own mind at that time, you don't have to grasp onto anything, and then you can part from the, the level of insight that is bound to seeing and not seeing, because it is beyond seeing and not seeing, which is inconceivable. Some of the masters often would be bound to uh, the words, and then they won't be able to understand the meaning which is of one taste. It is similar to those uh, academic scholars 
they would have a fixation on the, for example, a time of a certain person. This person was born um, in so and so years and died in so and so years. If the numbers were not correct, then they would start having lots of doubts. On one hand, I think the scientific research do require that mind of doubts. So they constantly doubt everything and then continuously to explore. On one hand, they rely on that doubt. On the other, they constantly search for something that is certain. And then the more they search and the more they observe, they will be able to find more evidence which could overturn their previous um, opinion, where they thought it was completely um, certain, completely unbreakable. But then maybe because of the maturation of the tools of the resources of the wisdom, the previously proven results would be overturned. Anyhow, I think whenever it comes to the um, kind of people who would grasp onto words, would grasp onto something as an evidence, let it be people who work in, um, in the scientific world or academic world, I think if you constantly grasp onto some solid evidence, then this teaching would be very difficult for you to imagine. It would be completely too unfathomable. So we've already covered on the part of the seeing is not separate. Now the next one is seeing transcends the ordinary. We can get uh, into this one a little bit as well. Then Ananda said to the Buddha, World Honored One, it is truly, as the Dharma King has said, the condition of enlightenment pervades the ten directions, clear, everlasting, and by nature, neither produced nor extinguished. After Mandrashri requested teaching from the Buddha, the Buddha then expounded such a profound uh, teaching. Therefore, later, whenever you have time, I really hope that you can contemplate upon this teaching because this particular um, teaching given by the Buddha to Manjushri is full of blessings and is um, quite touching. We have received such a profound teaching from the Buddha. How fortunate we are. This is so important than anything in this world. So I hope that you can spend some time to contemplate on, upon it. The great masters of the past, they would usually listen and study the Dharma during the day and spend their evenings in contemplation. I once read a biography of a great master where it says that when he was studying in schools, he didn't have those lamps. Therefore, he would study during the day and in the evening before the, uh, before the day comes, they would, uh, he would keep the, his eyes closed and contemplate on the teaching in his, head, in his head so that he could understand the teaching completely. Therefore, now, since we have the time, we have the conditions to uh, study during the day as well as the night, but sometimes maybe out of different conditions that you don't want to read, you don't want to um, you don't want to keep your eyes open, then you can close your eyes and then contemplate in your mind and slowly digest all of the information that you've received during the day. This is quite important to merge yourself into the teaching of the Dharma. Instead of searching with our eyes and our conception, our dualistic mind, why not to merge into the true gnosis? Because the power of the true gnosis is much more supreme. 
Ananda over here said that the world honored one, it is truly as the, the Dharma King has said. The condition of enlightenment pervades the ten directions, clear, everlasting, and by nature neither produced nor extinguished. The condition of enlightenment, there are a few different explanations. According to Master Jiao Guang, he said that this condition means the, uh, all the phenomena. And another uh, master, he pointed out that the condition actually points to Bodhi, and the, the enlightenment is Bodhi, and the condition means all the empty forms and uh, the uh, seeing and hearing. Uh, Master Tong Li, then he said that the condition of enlightenment is the seeing nature, but in the Tibetan translation, it is the condition of gnosis. So they are of the um, parallel uh, relation in this particular sentence. But I think we can understand it as seeing the nature. Over here, Ananda said that, well, since the Buddha just stated that the seeing pervades all ten directions, then from the worldly point of view, it is clear, everlasting, and by nature neither produced nor extinguished. How does it differ then from the first Brahma Kalipa's teaching of the profound truth or from the teaching of aesthetics who throw ashes on themselves or from the other externalist sects that say there is a real self which pervades the ten directions? Uh, this particular Brahma, Brahma Kapila, was mentioned in another story related to Ananda. If you remember, Ananda was taken by this Matangi woman, and then this Matangi woman's mother started to chant the mantra of uh, uh, Brahma Kapila. He is part of the school of uh, Samkhya, uh, India Philosophical School, which is a heretic school. And then some of the description says that he has golden hair. In his teachings, he talks about the truth, the profound truth. So out of the 25 truths, the first truth of permanent existence is the self. According to the Samkhya heretic teaching, they would say that the self that is constantly uh, existent and then, a, and then there's another heretic school that is called the Basman School. They would cover themselves in ashes in order to practice. They purposely practice the aesthetic practices such as walking on thorns and uh, uh, lying in thorn bushes, also burning themselves and so on. That's a part of the Aslaka uh, aesthetic school. Their practice are quite um, difficult. So according to their school, such as the Aslaka school or the uh, some, uh, Samkhya school, they practice in such a way or they, pr they uh, propagate the teachings of a per permanent existence in such a way. Uh, Out of all the heretic schools, some of them, they would say that there is a true self that exists and pervades all ten directions. So in the commentary, it says that there are a few of the different heretics that's mentioned. Uh, one is Samkhya, and the, the other one is the Basman, and then the Aslaka school. They would all claim that there is a true existent self. There is the big self, the small self, the uncertain self. 
according to the commentary of Fingers and Palm, uh, it is said that the so-called Big Self is all pervasive over the ten directions. So Ananda said that, well, since you said that the, the condition of enlightenment is all pervasive over the ten directions, that is exactly the same teaching to the Samkhya school. Then what's the difference? When we say that the awareness is all pervasive to the ten directions versus the heretics who talk about the permanent self is all pervasive over the ten directions. And then he continued to say that how does it differ then from the first Brahma Kapila's teaching of the profound truth from the teaching of the uh, ascetic who throw ashes to themselves from the other externalist sects to say that it is a real self which pervades the ten directions. Uh, that's the question asked. Also, in the past, the world honored one gave a lecture on Mount Lanka. Mount Lanka, sometimes in the Chinese language, sometimes a long, a Langa, Lanka. Um, it's up to you how you want to pronounce it. Anyhow, when the world honored one gave a lecture on Mount Lanka, explaining all the principles, thoroughly for the sake of great wisdom, Bodhisattva, and others. At that time, the Buddha said that the externalists uh, in their sects, they always speak of spontaneity. I speak of cause and conditions, which is an entirely different principle. The teaching of this part uh, that's given, uh, the, the teaching that's given by the world honor one at Mount Lanka is in the uh, Lankavatara Sutra. Whenever you have time, you can read into it. So the Buddha used to teach on the heretics. Um, they always speak of spontaneity, but the Buddha teaches on everything arises from causes and conditions, which is completely different. So the heretics would teach on how the naturally arisen, the spontaneously appeared self is constant, is permanent. But now you're talking about the spontaneity of um, condition of enlightenment or nature of enlightenment as spontaneous. So nature of enlightenment in, in Vajrayana teaching, we usually would call it as Rigpa. In my translation, when I used to translate, I uh, wasn't sure if there is a particular term, but as you can see, this particular sutra translated as uh, the same term as uh, uh, Rigpa. In Chinese language, that is. Over here in the sutra, it says the nature of enlightenment as spontaneous, as neither produced nor extinguished, and as apart from all empty falseness and inversion. It seems to have nothing to do with your causes and conditions or the spontaneity advocated by the others. Then could you please talk about how it is different than the spontaneity that's expounded by the heretics? Would you please enlighten us on this point, lest us should fall into deviant paths? thus enabling us to obtain the true mind, the bright nature of wonderful enlightenment. Would you please give us this teaching? Ananda asked the Buddha, saying that uh, so that we won't deviate onto the wrong path, so that we can truly understand the teaching. Could the Buddha please give us this teaching? Next class, we will then listen to the answer of the Buddha. The self that's taught by the Buddha is the kind of self that appears without any intrinsic existence. But when it comes to the heretics, let it be a permanent self or a purusha, the cosmic being, the self that is um, permeating the ten directions, they often talk about something that is truly existent. Existence. That is really the key point to understand. 
So let it be the Buddha nature, let it be Rigpa, let it be essence of seeing. If you were to say that there is solid existence, then the, your understanding is really of no difference than the heretics. The teaching given in the Lankavatara Sutra, where it talks about the causes and conditions, um, in next class we'll further expound on that. This point is really a key. Otherwise, if you don't understand this point, then you would see all religions as the same. You would think that there is something naturally pervading all over the space. Let it be a creator, let it be a god, let it be a permanent existent self, a Brahma. There is really no difference. In the Wish Fulfilling Treasury, when we talk about all the manifestation uh, that's manifested out of a Verachana Buddha, in fact, our view that that is of the, the biggest difference than that of the heretics is that we do not come to the recognition of Verachana Buddha is a truly existent thing or truly existent being. If we were to take Verachana Buddha and all his manifestations as a truly existent uh, and start to investigate to when he started to make it and when, when it ended and so on, it would be extremely difficult to establish. This is quite a key to understand. Uh, the later teaching that's given by the Buddha, I can't quite remember uh, the angle of his answer, but later we will look into it. But I think the key uh, of that answer is there is no truly existent, there's nothing that's truly existent in its nature. According to the other heretics school, um, they would come to something that is truly existent. So let's look into this teaching in next class. Tirgana,